One of the most significant takeaways from the recently concluded G20 summit was the announcement of the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. This mammoth project is being called India and the World's Answer to China's Belt and Road Initiative. So what is this new corridor and how does it benefit India? Welcome to TUI Business Bites. In this episode, Professor Harsh B. Pant of Observer Research Foundation gives us some interesting economic and geopolitical insights into a project that is being touted as a game changer. Uh, so, you know, for the benefit of our audience, to begin with, can you tell us what the India Middle East, you know, Europe Economic Corridor is? What is the project about? Yeah, this is a very uh, ambitious project which brings in uh, different geographies uh, in a broader connectivity project with, to ensure that these geographies are better connected to each other through various linkages, whether it is at this point, perhaps railways, maritime, and then eventually digital uh, connectivity as well. Uh, when, when we talk of you know data transfers to optical uh, cable, etc. So overall, there is a broader vision here to link uh, India, Middle East and Europe together into one economic whole. And I think in that sense, uh, it sort of brings these disparate uh, entities um, in a framing of an economic corridor, which is, of course, about leveraging uh, economic strengths. But it is also about leveraging uh, the geopolitical changes that are happening, both as India looks to the Middle East, as Middle East tries to move beyond its conflict-prone past, and as India links uh, to Europe via Middle East. So I think there are multiple aspects of this project, one linking uh, Middle East, uh, the Arabian Peninsula uh, through a railway line. So right. UAE and Saudi Arabia uh, and others uh, within the region connecting, uh, getting connected through an extensive railway network. And then that railway network connecting on the one hand uh, to, to Europe and on the other to India. And hmm. that I think ultimately is the ambition that this uh, expansive geography will allow these stakeholders to leverage their economic strengths vis-a-vis -vis each other and therefore bring prosperity and eventually also geopolitical stability uh, to, to this network. And I think that's that's where uh, the geoeconomics and geopolitics uh, are being fused together in this very ambitious undertaking. Okay, uh, but uh, Professor, if you could tell us, it's actually being called India and the world's answer to China's Belt and Road Initiative. So how does that work? See, any uh, connectivity initiative and particularly a connectivity initiative that is as ambitious as this one is, uh, would automatically be seen as a competitor to BRI because BRI, to be very honest, has been the only game in town. Hmm. You know, so, so BRI has, uh, has captured, I think, the world's imagination and attention now for almost uh, a decade because China had been there, out there. Uh, managing this huge infrastructure connectivity on its own and other nations, other actors have not had really good answers to it. So mm. I think any connectivity project that comes up is always seen as, as a competitor to BRI. But I would say that, look, at this point, BRI is a reality. India Middle East Economic Corridor is something that is a work in progress. We mm. still don't know the details, how this is going to pan out. We know the idea behind it, as we have just discussed. But we don't know whether the, the geopolitics and the geoeconomic logic of this, uh, something that makes it so attractive, perhaps can also derail it. That's right. so, so at, at this, at, we are very nascent stage at this point. So comparing it to BRI may not serve as any purpose. However, certainly, you know, when you look at the challenges the BRI is facing today uh, and the challenges that China is facing today with BRI, there is a you know, the opacity, the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability that surrounds BRI projects and the centrality of China to BRI. That China determines how it wants to proceed with BRI. China decides what projects are to be built where. A very centralized model of infrastructure and connectivity that China has, has proposed to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in some ways, in ideational sense, this project is an answer. That mm. look, we, we can have an alternative view of connectivity, an alternative view of infrastructure connectivity, which is where multiple stakeholders come together, 
where finances are a mix of private and public, where it is not simply in the hands of government. Uh, in, uh, in BRI, it's only Chinese money that is that is flowing around, Chinese government money that is flowing around. Here, it's a private, pub, public-private enterprise, public-private model of, of, uh, of development. Here, it is a multi-stakeholder model where multiple geographies, multiple nations are deciding what is good for them and therefore what is probably good for the region and beyond. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is a certain accountability here that, that, look, we want to do it in a sustainable manner, as Prime Minister Modi underscored in his comments uh, when this project was being announced, that we want to do it in a financially, environmentally sustainable manner, right. which is a critique of BRI because that's that's we have seen many of the projects of BRI falling under that trap and therefore leading... Uh, many countries who have taken recourse to BRI funds into a so-called debt trap situation. So right. I think in, in that in that context, if you look at it from that perspective, certainly an alternative, more efficient, more environmentally and financially sustainable model of infrastructure connectivity is being proposed by multiple stakeholders that believe that uh, greater transparency, greater accountability is better for these kind of projects and which will also ultimately lead to better geopolitical and geoeconomic outcomes. Okay, but as you spoke about the problems with BRI, so what are the kind of pitfalls that one should look to avoid and what are the lessons that this particular corridor can derive from China's BRI? Uh, I think the first lesson that, that should be learned is that if you are doing a mega infrastructure connectivity project, mega economic corridor uh, project, uh, it should always be there should there should always be transparency about it it should never be centralized overly centralized uh, it should be devolved where uh, different stakeholders can come to it on their own terms they can decide what is good for them uh, and therefore take what is what what is being proposed uh, uh, for their uh, well-being and for their prosperity and i think in that sense uh, perhaps uh, the at least at this stage at the ideas level the lessons have been learned the other would be that certainly, you know, uh, uh, financial sustainability is very, very important. Uh, we carry, we really cannot expect uh, economic transformation if we are not really filling up the uh, the, the foundation with financial accountability. Therefore, right. uh, you know, as especially for low and middle income countries, uh, this is going to be a very, very important criteria of how you uh, enter these pro projects and programs. Now, I think I would, I would just add that look. You, in some ways, given the ambitious scale of this project, while you can, you know, we we all can look at China and China's uh, BRI uh, as an alternative. We also have to see that China is also present along the way of uh, this project as well. You know, China is for the, the ambition here is to look at Piraeus port in Greece, right, uh, as the as the end destination of this project. Uh, and, uh, but China owns uh, that 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 port. Similarly, in Haifa, China is in, in Israel, Chinese presence is significant. And many of these countries that are part of uh, India, Middle East, Europe economic corridor are also uh, present in BRI. They are also members right. of BRI. So in that sense, I think uh, uh, what countries probably are looking at, especially low and middle income countries, they are looking at alternatives so that they can pick and choose uh, rather than as uh, two competitors, uh, right. which are which are buying uh, in, in some ways for uh, for connectivity. Okay, but, uh, you know, coming to the economics of it, so while there are geopolitical implications and positionings, it's important, as you said, that it should be economically viable. And from an India angle, you know, there, what are the kind of economic benefits that you foresee for a project of this scale? See, for India, the biggest benefit is certainly this uh, this sense that India can unshackle its its connectivity challenges with this project. For long, India has been trying to uh, propose connectivity projects, but for long, India knew that it was dependent on Pakistan for a while, uh, and Pakistan was not giving has not been giving India access to Central Asia or to Eurasia. So, in that sense, India was constrained what to do about it, and therefore, various projects have not really come to fruition. We also know that on the other side, India has uh, has been. Uh, signed on to has signed on to the INSTC, the India uh, North South Transportation Corridor. Uh, but there, the problem was that the Iranian san Western sanctions on Iran have not really allowed us to leverage uh, the Iranian Connect. So, so India has been boxed in in some ways. I think with this project, finally, uh, there is a sense that India can break out uh, and and make a you know and connect to 
uh, to Arabia, connect to all the way to Europe. And I think that's a very significant message. Uh, I think that Pakistan is being made almost redundant in India's connectivity landscape. And this allows India to leverage economic benefits, whether it is the energy relationship with Arabia or the economic relationship with, with Europe. In some cases, it has been pointed out that, look, uh, India, Europe, transport costs will be reduced by 60%, etc. I mean, that's a, uh, in, if, if that happens, if that can get operationalized, that's a huge advantage. India certainly looks at uh, the West, West uh, and Europe as its primary developmental and trade partner. So mm -hmm. certainly anything that reduces costs, that improves, increases efficiency uh, is good for India. The other, I think, advantage, of course, is that that um, this, we were discussing China's BRI, but the, but the reality there is all um, China's expansion of BRI has also constrained India. So on the one hand, you have Pakistan. On the other, you have China. And I think with this, certainly India is, uh, in, uh, by involving with like-minded partners like uh, Europe, US, uh, and some countries in the Middle East, India is trying to make a push that India, with its partnerships, can leverage them for its economic advantages. Uh, the, the, the other element would be that a number of countries in the West in particular, US and Europe, they have uh, for a long time been saying that we want to provide alternatives on connectivity. Hmm. And they have earmarked a lot of money. You know, you, you go back to the Build Back Better initiative of Biden administration and then Europe's infrastructure connectivity uh, uh, resources that they have allocated. These are huge resources. 300 million, for, for example, European Union has... Uh, earmarked for infrastructure development. Now, if uh, those uh, resources can be leveraged in this project efficiently, then they certainly help India. They help India's connectivity with the wider world. And they, of course, they help the wider corridor that is being created in, in leveraging those efficiencies. So I think uh, for India, this, is, uh, this can potentially be a game changer. Uh, this is a word that has been used in, the, in in this context and for good reasons, because this, I think, is a great degree of strategic imagination here at play. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, we have seen a lot of such projects coming in and going in the past. Uh, hopefully this will survive and hopefully this will see uh, concrete results at the end of the day. Okay. Are there any timelines to the implementation and from in India, again, India's perspective, any internal infrastructure that you think we need to have in place to make this global initiative a success? Uh, I think uh, the timeline is, of course, the first timeline that we are uh, everyone is looking at and talking about is the 60-day uh, expert group timeline that has been laid out, uh, where mm. the details will be presented in terms of how uh, and how much money uh, countries are going to invest, different stakeholders are going to invest. At this point, only Saudis have made an announcement, but others have not. Uh, so depending on how much money countries are willing to put in into this, uh, this will also be a very important benchmark for success of this project. So we have to wait till 60 days at least to see what is the overall overarching uh, resources available. What are the overarching resources available? What is the larger the, the construct that is being created and and, and proposed? But first, I think uh, that there has to be the the uh, the the rail line uh, in the in in um, you know in in the Middle East that is going to be critical right. because ultimately that's the center uh, which links. You. I would also just briefly add that. Uh, before this was announced, uh, Prime Minister Modi had also announced uh, as part of his 12-point uh, plan uh, at the ASEAN India Summit uh, that India is looking not simply at this corridor, uh, you know, to, to link India, Middle East and Europe. India was also is also proposing to link this corridor all the way to Southeast Asia. So I think there is a bigger ambition here, both in terms of India's projection of Eastern and Western fronts. Uh, how how it wants to link them. So I think that for India, certainly the stakes are high and India has to, as you said, also first ensure that its own internal infrastructure is in place. A lot of, we have seen a lot of infrastructure development in India in, in, in recent years. And I think that has to be scaled up for a project of this kind where you want to be part of this larger economic corridor. So I think whether it is the, the ports or whether it is the in, in, inland uh, transport connectivity both of them will have to be scaled up by india uh, and hopefully that will be done as this project moves forward because that is something that india in any case is planning mm -hmm. to do to, uh, as 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 india plans to take its economy all the way to 10 trillion over the next 5 to 6 years